you'll be hearing a lot about how big data, smart devices, and all the omics are going to transform medicine. And they will. But there's another trend that's going to change the way that we think about and practice health, and that's small data. My story is about small data that's derived from our individual digital traces. It's about a picture of your personal health that could be generated by a new kind of application running in the cloud that continuously and privately analyzes the traces that you generate as you work, play, sleep, eat, exercise, shop, and communicate. We do have special devices designed for self-tracking, like our Fitbits. I'm talking about an even wider array of data that most of us generate implicitly. We do that because we increasingly mediate, or at least accompany our lives, with mobile technologies. And as a result, we're continuously generating digital breadcrumbs in the services that we interact with. And those breadcrumbs woven together form our digital traces. You're generating those traces now, as you did when you got up this morning, perhaps checked your email or Facebook before you even got out of bed, and as you chose to maybe walk here by foot instead of getting on the tram. The service providers that we access, the search engines, the social networks, the mobile carriers, they capture and analyze that data extensively. They do that in order to improve their service, to target advertising, and to provide personalization. But they don't bring that data back to the person who generated them. So there's no existing vehicle that repackages the data about me in a format that's useful for me and makes it accessible to me. But there should be, because there's a lot that I can learn about my personal health from my digital behavior. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about doing detailed medical diagnosis. I'm not talking about replacing the communication between you and your doctor or with your loved ones or even your own self-awareness. I'm talking about enhancing each of these things with personalized, data-driven insights. Insights such as early warning signs of a problem, insights such as gradual improvement in response to a treatment. Ginger I.O. refers to this as a check engine light. I like to think of it as a digital social pulse. A pulse because it's a single measure that I can look at over time that represents my well-being, and social because it's something that I could selectively share with a small number of friends and family. Once we, as patients, as consumers, can get access to our digital traces, to our small data, we'll be able to fuel a new market of personal apps and services. For example, your doctor might look at the output of one of these applications to help to figure out whether the new dose of medication that she put you on two weeks ago is actually working better for you than what you were on previously. That application could analyze the location, the motion, the vocabulary data plucked from your digital traces and give her just such a comparative picture. You could use an application that helps you figure out whether a new supplement that you started taking for early stage arthritis is actually effective. That application could process the data streams that you might get back from your mobile carrier, AT&T, Verizon, and give you a quantitative and objective measure of whether, since you're on that supplement, are you actually getting up and about earlier in the morning because of that morning stiffness being gone, and are you overall less sedentary? Across a range of chronic diseases, from uh, chronic pain to depression, from memory disorders to Crohn's disease, there's tremendous day-to-day, week-to-week variability. There are many confounding factors, and changes are often subtle. And so it's difficult for us to provide reliable feedback on how we're actually responding when it's based solely on our selective and subjective memory. But as it happens, many of these conditions and how we're responding does play out in our day-to-day -day activities and behaviors. And really, for the first time in history, those activities and behavior 
are becoming data. Now, you might have misgivings about that, but it is the case. And so what I'm arguing for is that we should be able to mine those digital traces for our own purposes as well. And we should be able to do this for the young and old alike. We don't usually think of seniors as being digital natives, but increasingly, they carry with them phones, if only feature phones for now. And increasingly, they're on the internet, if only through their TV. But both feature phones and cable TV boxes are potential sources of digital traces. And moreover, as we become the seniors of tomorrow, we'll take with us our more sophisticated digital habits and addictions into our senior years. When I think back to my father's last few months of life, just over a year ago, I can identify signals that would have showed up in his small data, in his social pulse. He stopped responding to emails rapidly. And this is a man who had been using email since the early days of the ARPANET in the 1970s. His patterns around the neighborhood changed as he stopped shopping at the local supermarket to prepare food at home for his, him and my mother, and his neighborhood walks became shorter and shorter. These things did not show up at his regular visits to his cardiologist. They didn't show up on his EKG. And when his doctor asked him how he was doing, he said he was doing fine. He, like many of us, really pulled it together for his favorite doctor. Just a short time before he passed away, on a visit to an emergency room, the attending doctor didn't see anything atypical in the 90-year-old man in front of him. There was nothing in my father's vital signs or in his electronic health record that could tell that doctor that this 90-year-old was behaving entirely differently than he had been just a few weeks ago. A social pulse graph could have done just that. Now, I'm not saying it would have changed the outcome. It was his time. But it could have allowed us to communicate much more systematically and objectively with his clinical care team. Well, I'm very fortunate because I have a real doctor in the family. And my sister Margot's vigilance and insight effectively created a social pulse for my father. But the fact is, most families don't have a Margot. And so what I'm arguing for is that we can begin to leverage our small data to bring greater vigilance and insight to everyday care. We can think of it as a new kind of medical evidence. Medical evidence where N equals me, because it complements traditional big N population studies with data that are just about me or you over time. And we can begin to do this now because the data exist. We don't have to wait for deployment of a lot of new devices and complex systems. So if the data are there and the need is great, why isn't this happening? Why isn't it the standard of care? Well, I don't want to trivialize the work it will take to convert these noisy and disparate sources of data into actually robust markers of health. We're going to see a lot of interesting innovation and even competition as services come out to do just that. But for that to happen, we have to get access to our digital traces. And so what we need to do to start is what Todd Park refers to as data liberation. We need to liberate our data back to us, the user, from our digital services. And we need an open architecture so that a rich market of apps and services can grow up around that data, just like HTTP created the World Wide Web and led to the rich array, array of internet services that underlie our internet economy. Now, There, some of these service providers are apprehensive. They're worried about a PR nightmare resulting by giving you back access to your data. They're worried about you being startled by the extent of it. They're worried about you not treating it with the protection it needs. These are valid concerns. But my assertion is that a robust and sustainable privacy policy is one that's based on transparency. So let's assume that we can get past that disincentive. Where are the incentives for them to collaborate, to release that data? I think the market's on our side, and there's plenty of precedent. Just think about how much more you value your smartphone 
and the data services underlying it because of the wide market of third-party applications that you can download. So there are challenges. We need to make sense of the data. We need to navigate FDA and HIPAA and other valid privacy concerns. But I strongly believe that if we get the flow of our small data back to us, we can make the right thing happen and in the right way. So with my colleagues at OpenM Health and Cornell Tech, we're building prototypes that demonstrate the power of small data for personal health. And we're developing that open architecture so that your service providers and application developers and science researchers can start developing the applications and algorithms that are going to process and fuse and filter your digital traces for you. We've set up a small data website where you can claim your interest in getting access to your digital traces. You'll be the customer for the data about you. I'll be the customer for the data about me. Let's get our search engines, our social networks, and our mobile carriers to package up our small data for us. Thank you.